It's Brent. This is America. Don't got you slipping up. Look how I'm living up. Police be tripping up. Yeah, this is America. Guns in my area. I got the strap. So, hey there everyone. Um, today will obviously not be the video that I envisioned, and for most of the nation, it's not what they expected for the second day of June this year. Um, what I plan to be a pride themed makeup video will instead be a history lesson. Protesting is a cornerstone of change. Sit ins, boycotts, and marches are just a few of the nonviolent methods used across this nation's history in the fight for racial equality. A fight that's genesis is intertwined with our own countries. No one really has a problem with those, the nonviolent protests. But it seems like everyone has some form of opinion on the ones that have destruction involved. There are those that are passionately for them, thinking they're a generator of change. There are those that don't condone it, but they understand the rage behind it. And there are those who are more upset about the destruction, the vandalism, the looting, and the rioting than they are about the deaths of hundreds of unarmed black men over the course of the last few years. And what does any of this have to do with this channel's community, uh, the transgender community, the LGBT community, everything? Honestly, selfishly, progress for any minority is going to lead to greater progress for us all within the GSM, especially whenever that is the largest minority in America, a minority who has been fighting for equal rights, equal protection, equal treatment, not just under the law, but societally and in enforcement of the laws and department policies since we stole a nation's sons and daughters and mothers and fathers. And if you don't want a selfish reason, shouldn't we all demand a world where the same chemical that determines the color of your eyes that give me green and you brown or you blue or whatever color you have, where we're all treated the same, where I don't benefit from privilege because of that chemical or lack thereof. If that still doesn't convince you, if you're still against the movement, if you side more with the corporations and law enforcement agencies than you do with the rioters, than you do with the protesters, than you do with the looters, then I, I think it's time we revisit the past. I know many of us, myself included, probably didn't have a great understanding of gay history whenever they finally came to terms with their gender identity, with their transness. I know for myself, I spent most of my younger years trying to not engage in what I was because I was taught it was wrong. Any media I did consume that dealt with trans or LGBT stuff, it was typically me trying to verify that either A, I wasn't trans, or B, am I trans? Like those are the most common LGBT things I looked up growing up. Being in the rural South, you can guess I did not get much in the way of gay education. But the fact is that our rights today, as few and as tenuously held as they are, come directly literally directly on the backs of black transgender women, transgender women of color, and he, him, lesbians of color. All of this occurred in the late 1960s. Primarily, we're gonna talk about the Stonewall Riots. Back then, it was illegal to elicit same-sex relationships. It was illegal to dress in clothing of the opposite sex. It was illegal to be yourself. And police departments, like they do today for drugs that are deemed the next big boogeyman to society, took advantage of this. They conducted unannounced raids, they harassed LGBT community members, they stole money from businesses that were owned by LGBT individuals, and this was especially true of bars and inns and things like that that are havens for the LGBT community. I think the first place I ever presented publicly as myself was the only gay bar in Columbia, South Carolina that isn't membership based. During these rapes, they would take transgender women into the bathroom and they would pull their pants down or they'd take transgender men into the bathroom and they would pull their pants down and they would check to see what genitalia they had just so they could arrest them. On the night of June 27, 1969, police in New York City did their usual. They pulled up to the Stonewall Inn and they conducted their second raid on the Stonewall Inn in a matter of five days. They arrested bartenders, they harassed and sexually humiliated transgender women, and they roughed up other LGBT plus patrons. 51 years ago. That's how recently it was illegal to be you. That's how recently cops were not just harassing us, not just enforcing the law. They were enjoying beating us. They were enjoying humiliating us. 
they were enjoying being inflictors of abuse emotionally and physically. They terrorized the LGBT plus community like they continue to do to the black community today. Continuing on that June night, the community had had enough. A woman dressed masculine, a he him lesbian named Stormy Delar Delarvery, complained that her handcuffs were too tight as police harassed her. The crowd broke out into chants, hoppers, pig, things like that. Then someone threw a bottle, or maybe a brick, or a stone. Two people alleged to have started this, started the rebellion, started the uprising, started the fight back were two transgender women of color named Martha Johnson and Sylvia Rivera. I should also mention that the he, him, lesbian above, or mentioned before, was a lesbian of color. After this, the uh, throwing of objects continued, police tires were slashed, eerily similar to police cruisers here being vandalized or set on fire. They were doing this in response to police brutality, and not just police brutality of accident or mishap, but police brutality that certain police officers enjoyed. They enjoyed beating us for sport. They enjoyed victimizing us. They enjoyed raping us. They enjoyed killing us. They enjoyed terrorizing us. That's your history as a transgender woman. Think about that. The crowd grew and the rage intensified. Forced police officers who came there to terrorize the Stonewall Inn to take refuge and barricade themselves inside of it. The very building they had came to destroy and called a danger to the community was now their only refuge from the consequences of their actions. But the crowd wasn't satisfied. They used a parking meter as a battering ram to break the doors down. They were setting fires. They were throwing beers at windows. They created impromptu firebombs all to voice their displeasure with LGBT plus treatment in America. As reinforcements for the police officers arrived, the crowd dispersed. Um, living to fight another day. That day would be the next day. The Stonewall Inn actually reopened the next day. <laughs> Even despite all of the damage, all of the police brutality, all of the victimization of their patrons by police, by legislators, by community leaders, by the society they lived in, they reopened. The crowd that was there last night was back, but it was bigger. They chanted things like gay power and we shall overcome, which aren't that much different from black power and black lives matter today. But Cops, just like they are today, don't like to see their dark, dirty laundry aired. Though they showed up, they beat the gathering, they tear gas them just like they do today. And this continued until the early hours of the 29th of June. Things changed a little bit after that day. From June 29th until July 1st, a similar event transpired each night. It got a little more peaceful as time went on, but it was the same story. The crowd would gather, they would stand up, demonstrate their support of gay rights, and cops would arrive to quell the queers. But the movement had gotten too big. With isolated rights on these nights, and large-scale riots on the first two, the nation had to take notice. Some did in a dehumanizing way even, with newspaper headlines saying the forces of faggotry were at work, and also another one that was Queen Bee Stinging Mad. Again, this was only 51 years ago. And this was the catalyst to gay rights in America. The catalyst for my ability to go to a doctor and get estrogen valerate. The catalyst for systemic change of how police interact with the LGBT plus community. It's not perfect yet, they're tenuously held, but without this, without this event, without this destruction, without all of the things that I've mentioned here that happened in this riot, we would not be allowed to be ourselves. We would not exist. We would be as victimized today as the black community is anytime they interact with police. It would be illegal for us to exist on a sidewalk the same way it is for them. It wasn't a sit-in. It wasn't a boycott. It wasn't a march. It was destruction of property. And this is because oppressors rarely give up their power. They rarely hold their own accountable. They rarely make changes to the system to make it more equitable through dialogue. They do it usually the same way they oppress people. Fear. Fear of social unrest and division. Fear of loss of property. Fear of corporate outrage and fear for loss of life. And this has been proven throughout history. MLK protested peacefully and was still harassed and beaten. They were violent protests because of police instigation. The same is true today. I can show you right now clips after clips of police being instigators. Nelson Mandela, Nelson Mandela went to prison because his organization blew up buildings. Now granted, he blew up buildings with nobody in them. He blew up buildings. Well, you're free to think whatever you want. And well, you're free to unsubscribe from this channel because I stand with the BLM movement. And while you're free to dismiss the plight of our black brothers and sisters and leave them behind the same way that cisgender white gay men left the transgender community behind for decades and rushed on their laurels, I really, really hope you'll stand with them and that you'll stand with us. Thank you guys.
give them hell.